Well, now what about this Peter O'Toole story? Let's hear the beginning of it. I was born in Ireland and brought up in Yorkshire. And I was evacuated to Gainsborough, worked on a newspaper, went to the Navy, went to Rada and became an actor. Well, that's one kind of story. Now tell us the real story. And he came back and said, I want you out of this house in two hours. So, it really, I had to pack and leave because he, I thought, I must go now because he said I can go. But it was, it was quick, you know, it was, and I had to speak to the children. He wrote out a script for me, which I had to tell them, which wasn't true, and I just had to leave. How was I to know that this was always only just a little game to you? All the time I thought you gave your heart I thought that I would do the same for you Tell the truth, I think I should have seen it coming from a mile away When the words you say are, oh, baby, I'm a fool who thinks it's cool to fall in love if I gave a thought to fascination, I would know it wasn't right to care. Logic doesn't seem to mind that I am fascinated by a love affair. Still, my heart would benefit from a little tenderness from time to time. But never mind, cause baby, I'm a fool who thinks it's cool to fall. He was the most extraordinary man I ever knew. It was phenomenal because of Peter. Whatever he did, comedy, tragedy, farce, he could do it. And Peter O'Toole, which was a wonderful experience. This handsome kind of wolf-like creature. I miss him terribly because he was just such fun to be around. When I did the screen test, he was phenomenal. Peter would come in and assert his dominance, insisting on pissing in their, in their basin, in their dressing room. He was full of fun. He was just, he had such stature, he had such elegance, you know. I've only worked with one other actor who's given me that much freedom to play and excuse all the other wonderful people I've worked with. I learnt more working with Peter than in the rest of my career. Yeah, it was quite a remarkable one. He was a genius. There's the way he speaks, which is often over-articulated. brought up in a place called Hunslis, which is a remarkable place. It's uh, about four square miles of rabbit warrens, one up, one down houses, which was built very rapidly and rather badly by the copper buses in the Industrial Revolution. And people who lived there initially were um, from the green belt of Yorkshire, the Dales, who moved in and overnight became engineers and string makers and Yorkshire relish sauce makers, you know, the whole schmear. Of, and they, they lived on Yorkshire pudding, which was then hard tack. When the war started, much to my intense delight, schools were closed and I was then six. I was sent down to Gainsborough. I was sort of in farms and things. I came back to Leeds when I was 12 and I went to a school for uh, uh, my first time, really. I went for two years or just under and left joyfully, whistling, because I really couldn't bear school. I mean, they couldn't teach me anything that I wanted to know. I've got the kind of mind that rejects anything that I don't want to know, and it was no... What they could teach me, I could get out of books anyway, and did, and had done. I went to the Yorkshire Evening News, and I asked if they'd take me on, gave wrong ages and all that 
terrible nonsense, which I'd rather someone else had done, you know, so I did it. And uh, they accepted me. Great tea maker, runner, inquest, coroner's courts. But the most fun I ever had was in the photographer's department. In fact, it's the only thing I enjoyed. And uh, I finished up as uh, assistant art editor on the paper. I mean, His Majesty was desperate for my services at one point, and I had to nip into the Navy. I don't think he was too grateful. I was very perverse, I must admit. The Navy. Lovely, thank you. Very nice. Um, no, I was, I was a... I couldn't do it. And I, I, I used to play civilian all the time, you know, referring to the funnels as chimneys. The two years in the Navy are a total blank. It's I've rejected it. I've hypnotised myself. I've amputated the Navy from my mind. But you see, this business about becoming an actor, as I say, I was, I was born a ham. One is. I mean, nothing else I could do. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is to um, go to a school for a while, because I still had a, this ghastly Irish Yorkshire accent I thought should be ironed out, so I thought I'd go to school. But which one? I hadn't the faintest idea. Went to Rada and became an actor. Back in the 50s, so O'Toole was in the same acting class as uh, Albert Finney, who was offered Lawrence before him, Alan Bates... Uh, Brian Bedford, uh, Richard Briers, and Richard Briers, who I knew well, said back then, when O'Toole was only in his early 20s, the other students would call him Sir. There was already this sense that there was something exceptional about this guy. And I said to Richard, well, what was it? What did you see in Peter O'Toole when he was 22 years old at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, down from Yorkshire, but 100% Irishman? Uh, what was it? And he said, well, he was just, he was electric, love. It was as simple as that. O'Toole was bloody electric. So his reputation as a stage actor was pretty strong, particularly from Bristol, when he went to Bristol and he played, oh, he played that, the Hamlet in Bristol. And a lot of people who saw him there, people like, there was an actor I knew called John Phillips, I think was in that with him, and he said there was nothing like him, that when he walked on the stage in that time, there was nothing like him. I saw O'Toole at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre and uh, he was playing Jimmy Porter in John Osborne's Tremendous play, revolutionary play of its time. I'd never seen anything like it, and he inspired me to be an actor. He was probably the most dangerous actor I've ever seen. He was quite brilliant on stage, like an electric light. He developed in the most wonderful way. This is the bedrock of his career, really. He went there as a, as a boy and out of RADA, not with a good reputation at all, not, not having done well at RADA. And he played tiny parts, walk-ons, for a year. 18 months, and he really worked hard, and he finally was playing the leading parts by the time he'd finished. So his training was immaculate. He did everything by the book, and he learned how to work, and he learned how to do well, and he became a star at Bristol. His, his fame was all over the theatre. We were all talked about Peter O'Toole at Bristol. That conveys somewhat of the Bristol days. On stage, he was mesmerising. He could do any accent. He was doing uh, Waiting for Godot at one rehearsal, and I was allowed in to watch. This man was overpoweringly tense, spell-bindingly powerful. Everyone, dwarfed, disappeared when he appeared on stage. He was like a, he was like a wolf. Foxy or wolf-like. There was something... He was a canine. He's been described as a wolf. Well, he had that look about him, that sort of hungry thing of thing he did. Well, we met on a pavement the very first time. I went to Good Street for lunch one day, which was an unusual thing, because we didn't have any money, any of us. It was outside the spaghetti house, where I was a student in Prada, and O'Toole was a, was a leading young tearaway leading man at Bristol, Old Vic, and his fame had arrived back at RADA, and I was very impressed, because there he was, I came out of lunch, and there he was with a few friends, and I was with friends, they knew each other, and they introduced us, and he looked to me like that character in Pinocchio, you know, that the, the, was it a wolf, or a, there was a man who led the children astray, I haven't seen the film for a very long time, and um, he looked like that to me, kind of wolf-like, creature in a green jacket and um, curly hair and um, 
we were introduced and uh, we passed a few pleasantries and off I went back to a student and uh, to be a student and he went off to Bristol Old Vic and and I thought as I was walking back I thought well I'll marry him one day I suppose and I thought no more about it I didn't meet him again for three years and we did in fact marry in five years time I just remember my grandmother um, Mam Gee she lived in South Wales most of her life and she she said when my parents were getting married, she said she did have reservations because she'd seen, you know, she said, oh, the marriages between the Irish and the Welsh. It's like oil and water. They never mix. When we got married, he still had brown, black, curly hair. And um, he looked completely different. He looked very Irish, you know. People gave him a really bad time in the press and his friends about the nose, which was so ridiculous. And his nose had been broken in a match with the rugby Swedish police that his submarine had docked somewhere in Sweden and they played a rugby match and he'd been kicked in the nose. So it nothing was added to the nose, but it went sideways at the bottom and lighting men had a terrible problem with this curvature of the nose. So all they ever did, because I was there at the time, was straighten it and put it back straight. And you would have thought that he'd had major surgery, you know, the, the way people went on about it. It was really bad the way to, they treated him. And he was very, very mortified about that, but he didn't complain. He said, well, when I was doing the, the day they robbed the Bank of England, I said, you know, I want a car. They said, oh, no, no, Mr. O'Toole, this is your first film, your first big film, no car. Oh, how am I supposed to get there? Well, it's public transport, you know, you'll be fine. The first day of filming, he didn't turn up. Where's Peter? Where's Mr. O'Toole? Not there. They rang, where, where, where are you? He said, well, where's the car? He said, no car, no me. And that was it. So from there on, he always got his car. Well, Lawrence of Arabia came along after he'd had a misstep in his career, actually. Things did not go well for him after The Long and the Short and the Tall. Uh, the movies that he made were not successful, though it was wonderful to be paid a little bit of money. We had a talk about it, and, and I said, look, I think you should go back to basics and start again in the theatre, if, if you can. So he said yes, and Stratford came up. Moshe of Venice and Taming of the Shrew and uh, Troilus and Cressida. So I thought, so we both thought this would be a wonderful thing for him. And we went back and it was a wonderful thing for him. He was magnificent Shylock and he was a wonderful Petruchio. And Peggy Ashcroft adored him in, uh, in that particular season. Uh, they were doing um, uh, Taming of the Shrew and she didn't know how to do the business. Sit here, Peggy, stand there, Peggy, put your leg there, Peggy, kick there, I won't fall down. So that's what the comedy, it's circus of it, slapstick. Come here, Peggy, come here. And he taught her all the movements of the whole play. They still have those movements at Stratford. They still have them in the curriculum. They're referred to O'Toole's movements for the Taming of the Shrew. And then Peggy adored him for his greatness and talent. When he had made one film that was kind of okay for his new business manager, who happened to be an American film producer. And he, it was the day they robbed the Bank of England, and he played an Englishman, a very clipped officer. And that was the film that David Lean saw. An assistant of David Lean spotted uh, O'Toole in the day they robbed the Bank of England and got David Lean to see it and then took David Lean up to Stratford to see him play either Petruchio or Shylock and said, he's the man. And David wanted him for Lawrence and Sam Spiegel did not want him at all because he'd just finished doing a film, I think, with Monty Clift and he'd had enough of the drinkers. He didn't want another one. <laughs> This has three keys, I'm told, each kept by a different official, on the person, as it were. There had apparently been a meeting with Sam Spiegel and Peter O'Toole previously about something else, and O'Toole had referred to him as Mrs. Spiegel, which rankled with Sam Spiegel, who didn't think that was funny at all, and was very much against it. And I think David Lean, rumours has it, had to fight a bit to get O'Toole 
into playing Lawrence because Spiegel was not very pleased. Also, he knew of the reputation of being a wild boy. Because Albert was going to play it, you know. I mean, it's very interesting about Albert and, you know, Albert and Peter were at drama school together. So, um, in the end, David prevailed, but the film helped a lot. It helped enormously. It was huge. It was absolutely huge. It was undeniable. We all knew that we were in the presence of, of stardom and David Lean, probably his finest picture. I think that's where he was so sharp. He knew how he wanted to look. It's called, the, Stanislavski Lasky calls it the mask, or you, you, know, you put on the clothes or you put on this and suddenly you become the part. And I think Hotul did that. I don't know, so I can't say it precisely, but I suspect that he knew how to look, he knew how to shape himself. What Peter did was he found the core of the man. That was a great thing. I mean, I never forget that performance. I think it's one of the truly great film performances, actually. I really do. What is your name? My name is for my friends. None of my friends is a murderer. My name is for my friends, and none of my friends are murderers. You know, I mean, I was just, it was electric doing that. And he had this kind of, there was something about Peter, he had this, in that role, he had this sort of thwarted spirituality about him. He looked sensational. Um, he had this wonderful ability. He was, he was also a great actor. Um, and he was mesmeric on screen. Two large glasses of lemonade. In Lawrence of Arabia, Peter O'Toole speaks slow, and you feel that he doesn't speak much, but when he asks, when he walks into that club, for two glasses of lemonade. It's for him. It's for him. It's for him. You think, well, you can't say it's for him, and he's slower than that. But frankly, the it's for him has underneath it hand grenades, mines, a minefield of you feel as though he's going to reach across and pull that bomb on the other side of the bar. And that, and that sense, you know, Tool's performances of, um, and maybe it seems a bit cliched, but this a sort of contained rage. Not a club boy at all. All that stuff when he goes to the officer's mess, it was clearly, he did all of that. And that's all Peter. That's all of him, you know. I mean, Lean, of course, directed it brilliant. And then the wonderful thing when he has the dagger and he sees his own image and he does that incredible, his vanity. And then he gets shot and he goes, good, 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 you know. I mean, yeah, it's a great, great performance. It's a really great performance. In the quietest of pieces, in something like Lawrence, to use that as an example, that the sense of an inner turbulence that either, I don't know, Maybe he's just the greatest actor in the world and he could flick it on, or he opened up his own access to something truly yet yeah, turbulent is the impression I have, and it made you feel uneasy, his performances made you feel unsettled, and it made you generally feel uh, that he was dangerous, and in the presence of an O'Toole performance, what you were aware of was that the unexpected was possible at any time. Never seen a man killed with a sword before. Why don't you take a picture? It was in his contract that I would fly out every month. Well, I couldn't fly out every month. It was impossible over two years. So I used to sort of um, put the time together and go and live there in the desert. And David was such a perfectionist, he would look through his... whatever you look through, you know. And... Um, Say, no, not quite right, we'll wait a bit, wait a bit. You could wait a day, you could wait two days, you could wait a week. But then he, he liked to become, um, to break actors down completely and then rebuild them completely so that he was responsible for them and he would be wonderful to them. Well, I, I can't see anyone breaking Peter. <laughs> I think anyone trying to break Peter would just, he'd go the other way. And one day he tried that with O'Toole. It was the day they... they um, so, uh, that O'Toole sang uh, The Man Who Robbed the Bank at Monte Carlo. It was a long tracking shot. And they started first thing in the morning, 127 degrees, no shade. O'Toole in khaki up to there with a hat and everything. And he would sing the song and ride along very slowly until he was out of shot. And um, David just said, mm, have another one. And they did it all day. 
the, the crew were dropping because there was no shade. It was intolerably hot. I was miles away on a, sitting on a box watching in horror, you know, at this. And I realised this was the day that, that Lean was going to break Peter down and he was going to uh, build him up again. And I looked and I thought, this is never going to happen. He's not going to break down. <laughs> He's not going to do it. So, and he didn't. I don't know why a man like David Lean or any other man or any other woman for that it has this, this desire to break people down. Lean wouldn't break him down because he wouldn't put up with that English bollocks. That's what, you know, his Celtic soul would not put up with that English imperialism. So I suspect that was a real clash of wills. If a director knows what he's about, then do 50 takes. And someone like John Houston would do two takes, or David Lean would do 25. I'm the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo. It was a wonderful, wonderful period in our lives. We'd not been getting along very well before that. And the, the birth of my first daughter seemed to trigger off something horrible in him. I don't know, it was some huge crisis, although he was the one that was keen to have a child. It, he wasn't ready for it at all. He wasn't prepared. So um, he, he was insistent that life should go on exactly the same as when we didn't have a child. Well, that is very, very difficult. Some of our great contemporary filmmakers, uh, Scorsese and Spielberg and the, those sort of figures, the very famous directors of the last 30 or 40 years, all rate Lawrence as, as one of the great movies of the 20th century, one of the very, very best. He got paid £19,000 for doing Lawrence and Jules advised him to take it because he said it'll be worth it. <laughs> and it was, of course, because the next, then he went into the big paycheck. He did it for very, he was the lowest paid actor on the, on the whole uh, picture, I would think. It didn't change him fundamentally, no. He was exactly the same O'Toole that he'd been before. You know, at home, he was just the same. And he didn't really buy into the stardom business. For instance, he would never travel with an entourage. You know, everybody, every movie star like Harris or Burton, they had people, you know, secretaries, uh, hairdressers, people, and uh, who fixed things. O'Toole never. He would travel with the stuntman, usually made friends with the stuntman, and they would shack up together. And that was his team, as it were. And that remained so all the time I knew him. And I think he deeply respected David Lean, perhaps more than almost any other director, and later turned down Dr. Zhivago, which rankled with Lean. Uh, but O'Toole said, he didn't speak to me, I didn't say anything. I couldn't get my head into this character. In later years, they became friends again, and he was with Lean when Lean passed away. I don't think there can be people like him anymore. I, I mean, it used to, I remember doing a film years ago, the first film I did virtually, with, with, which Ken Branagh directed, and I remember we were sitting around at the time saying, no one is ever going to tell stories about us in 50 years' time. Oh, and do you remember, that was the time that Ken Branagh dropped his teaspoon. I mean, that's about all that happens. We are so bloody ordinary, that our generation, compared to that remarkable group of people who were not only just more daring as actors and performers who were more, more sort of prepared to, to strip themselves of any dignity and to throw themselves into a role and yet annoyingly retain that sexiness and that extraordinary charisma. But they also lived a life that was richer and more careless. We were in the hall one day. And I used to go to a little restaurant up the hill there, uh, <laughs> quite simply to avoid the bar because when we got together, it was chaos. <laughs> and I was sneaking one night and uh, he was being helped out. Um, he, he was fine, he wasn't too drunk, but he was, you know, he liked to drink and so on. But next day on set, I'd never seen it was a blistering performance, a great performance. And uh, uh, nothing seemed to affect him and he was, uh, he had tremendous recovery in him uh, because he was dedicated and he was uh, focused. And we Celts have been buggered for so long. We really have. I mean, we've been treated so badly. Second, I mean, the Irish, don't get me started. I mean, we were treated like shit. I mean, and, and that's a thing that is in our DNA. We carry this sense of defeat. 
We have to get over it. But it's a tough one. But that's what's so extraordinary about that, that the, 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 the Irish have learned. But that it's about how do I deal with control? I'll get pissed because I don't want to be controlled by anybody. I'll just get pissed. I'll, I'll drink. And Richard had it. Peter had it. Albert never had it. You know, Donald McCann had it. Donald McCann was one of the great actors, really another great actor. He had it and it, it fucking destroyed him. And that's, that's a historical thing that's happened again and again and again and again and again. And I think Peter was walking a tightrope through all of that in order to be the classical actor that I think he really wanted to be, and he certainly was and certainly could be. Because I find when I play it, and I don't want to talk about it really, I am most moved in the play with the ghost. Because the ghost is the key to that play. I've often felt that the best actor in the company ought to play it, and the up-and-comer ought to be Hamlet, you know. And people like O'Toole, I think, and Wells always brought to any kind of story, any sort of genre story, including a revenge story, including their dalliances with something like Hamlet, uh, this complexity. I was uh, playing um, Laertes, he was Hamlet. Our relationship was purely professional to start with, and then we, we became friends. I was in awe of him, I admired him. I, he, he had the bizarres that I didn't have. I can't tell you what pleasure it was to me to hear that from Peter O'Toole, because people always talk about what Hamlet is as though we were a universal man, or as though we were a figure in a 19th century novel. I mean, as a young actor, I, I'd never seen anything like it. I just thought, this man is amazing. And I remember seeing the Hamlet, the dress rehearsal of Hamlet, which was pretty chaotic, actually. Sure. I think he's perfectly it capable depends of on which murder. Text what he is not capable of in is some performing the no lead role scene. in a in a revenge tragedy. I, I remember when we rehearsed uh, the the fight scene, for instance, Hamlet, Olympic swordsman teaching us this routine, um, and then one day uh, Peter said to me, "Look, let's go up to the rehearsal room and work out another routine because the routine he's given us isn't." It, gutsy enough, you know, it's not spectacular, not swashbuckling enough. So uh, we went up to the rehearsal and worked out um, a much more swash and buckle. Um, um, but th then we opened the show and it got reasonable reviews, but not spectacularly good reviews. And Peter, who'd been on the wagon uh, all through rehearsals, he'd been such a good boy, um, because it wasn't hailed as the great, the great Hamlet, he went back on the booze a bit. And uh, so sometimes, not always, but often, um, when we got to the duel at the end of the show, he would wink at me across the stage, which meant fight for your life tonight, son, because I'm not sticking to any routine. And he used to swish at the front row, you know, and... Uh, but it ended up with him getting hurt because uh, I cut his finger and uh, he had a scar on it for life. And uh, every time we met, he would do that to me, to remind me. I mean, after Lawrence of Arabia, he goes back on stage to be in Brecht Ball. Uh, he does Ride a Cock Horse on stage with Sean Phillips at the Piccadilly Theatre, the David Mercer play. So he constantly goes back to the stage after. And I think he admired actors. This is why he didn't like the Peter Halls and the John Bartons of the Royal Shakespeare Company, because that was the director's theatre running the company. And with keep films, he can, well, A, keep all the money. That's what, what it was about as a joke. Jules Buck, Jules and Joyce Buck became very important figures in our lives, obviously. And we used to love to listen to Jules talking about Hollywood. He was, he knew the great days of Hollywood and he'd worked there all his life. One night we were there for dinner at Jules and Joyce's lovely new house in Belgravia. And uh, I fell asleep, of course, on the couch eventually around about four in the morning. And I woke and they said we formed a company, a film company, Keep Films. But he can have greater influence. On which material will he pick? This is why we have the ruling class, country dance, the lion in winter. It's all the choices of things that he wants to make.
We were four directors, uh, uh, Jules Buck and his wife and myself and O'Toole. He was an American producer. You know, he was, uh, he was a nice man and he was... Uh, they fell out in the end, but that was after I'd left. I remember Richard Burton. He was around all the time. I remember having to step over his drunken corpse to get my school bags in the morning, creeping around with the record player would still be playing at the end. Remember when they just go, T -t 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 -t, there'd be that sound and the air in the sitting room would be full of smoke from the cigarettes and dead people all over the floor snoring. Produced all of the films. Produced Beckett as well. He got Burton and uh, the whole cast together. Yeah, it was quite a remarkable man. He was a genius. It happened in Canterbury, England, eight centuries ago. A story as ageless as time itself. The immortal story of a man called Beckett, who earned a king's most trusted friendship. Business, my lord. Who shared his most intimate secrets. <laughs> I must say I adore my French possessions. They're certainly worth recapturing. Then I saw Beckett, uh, just after Lawrence of Arabia. I hadn't still hadn't met him. And that was another extraordinary performance. The end of it, of the, that film was extraordinary. He and Burton together. Wonderful performance, um, wonderful. And I think that's what O'Toole did. He hit the ceiling. Damn. And he did it. I would have gone to war with all England's might behind me and even against England's interests to defend you, Thomas. I would have given away my life laughingly for you. Only I loved you and you didn't love me. That's a different and again, beautifully shot, Peter Glenn with an actor's director. Uh, and you can see Burton holding back a lot in his performance. Gentlemen, it is a supreme irony that the worldly Beckett, the profligate and libertine, should find himself standing here at this moment. Jewel going out there and he's sometimes, again, almost electrifying in energy and then also the vulnerability. It was very gritty, it was very dark. And all of the Hollywood tinsel, if I may, no disrespect to Hollywood, but it was polished away so we could see the real characters. And I think Peter, on that film, said no drinking. Him and Burton had to come up to an agreement and say, look, no drinking, let's get through this. The story of Beckett is recorded here, right up to the last brutal, bloody act. <laughs> Curse and a blessing, the alcohol and all that stuff. That's a big blessing and a curse as well. It'll kill you. Uh, or it'll make you survive. It gives you the drive and the danger to move on. It gives you a sort of false courage. And for a while it works, and then you get a point when it'll <laughs> take you down. And I think that's what happens to many people. You know, no one's perfect. But what was extraordinary about him was that he was that magic person. He had that muscle inside him, which was part of his drinking and his passion. I would label Peter as a man who enjoyed having a drink. He really liked it. And he had a good time drinking. That's how I would label him. I would never, I wouldn't have said he was an alcoholic because he could, I mean, he apparently could stop. He did stop through most of Lion in Winter because of, of, of what Kate had said to him. The story of the, of the pub in Dublin that where he and Peter Finch buy the bar um, because the, the barman wants to close up and they say, come on, we've got to stay, we've got to drink more. Well, how much? We'll buy the bar off you. So they buy it and then um, the next day they rush over to try and get their cheque back. It was a generation that had grown up at the very end of the war. Peter used to say, he used to say, you know, as soon as the war ended, we just thought we are going to have fun now. And of course there was rationing for another 15 years, but we could drink. And he said, that's why our generation drank in public and in pubs and in the open, because it was something to celebrate. And it was a, a pub, an act. He said, your generation, you go, you drink in private bars and in private clubs and at home, you're, you're ashamed, aren't you? And, and he was sort of right. 
I mean, yeah, he, he'd say in the middle of the day, oh, it's an easy day, there were maybe not a lot of dying. Let's have a bottle of shampoo. He'd call champagne shampoo. So he'd, he'd call up for a bottle of... But it wasn't because he was sitting there thinking, oh, God, I've got to have a drink, I've got to have a drink. He got to take, take it or leave it as he wanted to. Boozing like mad. And the, the thing was that going out with Peter, I would always finish up tiddly. Not drunk, but quite tiddly. I think he was a tormented man. Uh, uh, yeah, he was that. I didn't know him that well in those post years. But whenever I saw him, I remembered uh, what a, a great tempestuous man he was. He had packed up drinking because of an operation he'd had, and he wasn't on. He stopped taking cocaine and stuff, which I think had ruined most of his nose. But he, he's quite a character. Crazy, yeah. And he, when he stopped drinking as much in the 70s, he did become a bit of a cokehead, which is quite surprising for his generation. <laughs> dear, oh dear, as if he needed it. I mean, good Lord, but then who might speak? So he didn't live like a rock star in his private life, but yes, in his public life, he had to a bit, you know. Yeah. People would be too disappointed. I think it's that he never really felt alive unless he was on a tightrope. And that's what made his theatre acting so exciting, was that that this sense that it could fail at any minute, that he was pushing it, and that it was an adventure, and he wanted you all to be a part of that adventure. And, and that's quite hard for other actors to cope with, because how do they live up to that? Peter O'Toole going out with a friend of his, having a few drinks, and going to the theatre and saying to him, this should be interesting, this is where I come on. All right. It's funny. I'd heard that 50 years ago, attributed to Wilfred Lawson, and some old actor said it could even have been Edmund Keane, like in 1800 and something. So the agent gave me the script and said, there's a good part for you in this film. O'Toole's manager sort of saw it and said, what is this? And I said, well, it's this film they think I'd be right for. And I was to play Capuchin's part in it. And um, and he said, could I have a look at it? And he had a look at it. And I didn't hear anything about it for a few weeks until I discovered that O'Toole was going to make it and Capuchin was going to play <laughs> her part. <laughs> Love scene 2A, take four. Peter Sellers, Peter O'Toole, Capucine. Action! Oh! Hello! Good morning! Oh. Can't you knock? Knock? But I'm in dire need. So am I. What do you think I am, human? Bring it up at the next group analysis meeting. Something like that. Not, not now. Cut, cut. Read it. How to Steal a Million, uh, tall and slender, Audrey Hepburn, beautiful, tall and slender, beautiful Peter O'Toole, uh, and, and they're great together. A heist. A heist? Oh, you mean a burglary? What's the score, baby? The Cellini Venus. Working with Audrey Hepburn, the chemistry is perfect, it's a gentle comedy, directed by William Wiley, who did Ben-Hur. Why not? Henley. Madam. Did you ever love me? No. Good. That will make this pleasanter. And Lion in Winter, Lion in Winter. It's a great, great movie. It's, it's a wonderful performance. And the, the chemistry between them both is just amazing. Um, Hepburn is is wonderful and uh, iconic, as is as is Peter, um, and he he just blossomed on film. Uh, the the thing about Peter was that um, on stage, his personality was big, um, and theatre filling. In films, with the camera able to get there, um, he could pull it all back all back and still be sensationally powerful. I taught you prancing lamb and lute and flute. <laughs> That's marvellous. Absolutely me.
in line in winter. He, he didn't overact, but he was big. I mean, he, he, he filled uh, that space. I don't have to fight to win. Take all you want. This county, that one, you won't keep it long. What kind of courage have you got? One night under the dressing room door, knocking the door, and it's Peter O'Toole. <laughs> and uh, he'd have a few little tipples, and he was wearing his green cap, green Irish jacket. He said, I want you to do a film test. And so I did the scene. It's right, he said, uh, do that improvisation I've heard about. So I gave some improvisation which had shocked people, I guess. He said, right, you've got the part. So they sent me the script. And I read the script and I thought, if I don't get this part, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> it was such a, such an extraordinary script. Where have you been all night? Making us an entourage. What for? We're off to Rome to see the Pope. He's excommunicated you again. No, he's going to set me free. I'm having Eleanor annulled. The nation will be shocked to learn our marriage wasn't consummated. And Peter was there and I met him and how would he do and all of that. Nice man, etc. He said, well, let, let's do a little scene from Country Dance. He said, let, let's do a little of that. I said, oh, well, that's going to be easy because I'm doing it every night. Um, so we started into the scene and he said, stop, stop, stop. I thought, oh, God, what's going on? He said, I don't believe a fucking word you're saying. And I, <laughs> I froze. I thought, oh, God, I've blown this. You know, there's no way I'm going to get this part. You mean it. Shall I kneel? It's not another trick. The bridal party's drilling on the cobblestones. I thought this, if I get this part, this is going to be the thrill of my life. Would you like a formal declaration? There. My finest angle, it's on all the coins. He was a really a force to be reckoned with. And I really don't remember very much else about anything except him. And then with Catherine Hepburn, who was a legend at that time, uh, as a film actress. Execute him. They're assassins, aren't they? He was called Presence, and uh, it was, had that dangerous quality, and that's what made him the great star that he was. If you want to know my plans, just ask me. Conquer China, sack the Vatican, or take the veil. I'm not among the ones who give a damn. Its theatricality is probably the thing that drew it back from the Oscars. You don't. Dear God, the pleasure I still get from goading you. He was uh, quite extraordinary. He, yes, he controlled that whole film. And uh, Spencer Tracy had just died and Catherine Hepburn, he got her out of retirement. She didn't want to work anymore. So he cast her, he managed to cast her. And I think he may have come in for some criticism. But he encouraged us. And that's what I never forget about him. Beautiful. I did it. No! It wasn't like that! But it was. But at the same time, you know, our, in, ter in terms of, of O'Toole, um, that Hepburn, of course, and John Barry for the score, brilliant score, uh, that got the Oscar one of three of the five nominations. So it, it did get recognised. And she was pretty formidable as well, but also, like O'Toole, uh, a great egalitarian. They knew the crew's name. She was always wonderful with the crew. And there's the family there. Timothy Dalton, John Castle, Nigel Terry, Catherine Tappen and O'Toole. And I had a little speech to do, an angry speech. And I did it. And I had no fear. I, the arrogance of youth. I'd have the Aquitaine and Alice and the Crown. I'll not give up one to get the other. I won't trade off Alice or the Aquitaine to that walking posture. And he came over and said, that's it. He gave me such encouragement. That's that's Richard the Lionheart. What's wrong? You're Richard, aren't you? But you're Henry. Kate would not have any visitors on the set at all from outside unless they had something to do with the film because she said they're bringing the wrong energy onto the set. They're, they're not part of the family. She wouldn't have it. Did your father sleep with me or didn't he? But they both said, if you want to come on and watch. Well, I did. I wanted to watch because I knew I could learn a lot. Ask for something. Eleanor, we're past it, years Test past. Test me, name and act. There isn't one. About my fornication with your father. Yes, there is. You can expire. You first, old man. I only hope I'm there to watch. You're so afraid of dying. You're so scared of it. And there was this one scene that um, O'Toole has with, 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 with Catherine. 
Hepburn, where he's, she's goading him and, and teasing him and taunting him and everything else, and he's is just driving him completely mad. I love your father's body. He was beautiful. It never happened. I can see his body now. Shall I describe it? Eleanor, his arms were buff with scars. No! I can feel his arms. The scene was so intense. I mean, it was just, it was so raw. And when it was over and this cut, Peter turned around, side of the bed and vomited. From my first film to be in the film with him, uh, a great star like that was, you know, uh, that was a red letter day for me. Oh, he hated working with me. He hated it. If someone gave me a part, so I, got, I got a part in Goodbye Mr Chips because I was in Paris when the student revolution was on and I got stranded with the director and he said, you know, you'd be perfect for the, the actress in um, Goodbye Mr Chips. And I said, oh, would I? And he said, yes. Uh, come down to the studio, so I went to the studio, and he said, yeah, yeah, you've got it, he said, that's it, you do it. I said, wonderful, and I went home, and I didn't say anything to O'Toole, because he, we were also the producers. And then one day he found out, and he was furious. He said, no, you've got a sucker. They said, well, she's got a contract. He said, I don't care, I don't want to work with her. And he didn't tell me that, but they said, there's a problem. I said, well, look, if it's a problem, then let it go. That's all right. And they said, no, no, it won't be that bad. Just come. So I went to work, and he wouldn't speak to me, and he wouldn't rehearse with me. Three times you've made me laugh, and only this morning I really did think I'd never laugh again. I suppose it's your being a schoolmaster. I fail to see what's so laughable about that. Well, of course, he's very tall, and I'm, a, I'm sort of... Petite. <laughs> um, but that didn't seem to bother him. And uh, he was lovely and generous right from the first moment I met him. He wasn't sort of like the great actor, you know. I know when we, we were doing Goodbye Mr. Chips in Italy, he used to have every morning a Fernie Branca. He had to have it every morning to, to cope with the mm, hangover. Step on up, pushing it high. I can feel it that you're gonna go far. She well, had been George Jamison in the Navy, and she was the most beautiful girl. I mean, she was just, she was tall and statuesque and gorgeous. And she had a very deep voice. And she dressed beautifully. She became a top model and she worked at a club of transvestites in Paris, a very famous one, where the, the girls were so beautiful. And April turned up in Spain at one point, and that was where she met Omar and um, O'Toole. O'Toole knew she was George Jamison. April Ashley, one of the very first tr transgender, but I think she was visiting the... She was in... Uh, they were shooting Lawrence of Arabia, and Peter set her up with Omar Sharif. And Omar Sharif got quite a long way with her, was very entranced. And then when he discovered, he chased Peter with a knife round and round the hotel. He was furious. In a place called Le Beau, we were drinking vignac. <laughs> I don't know what we were drinking. We were drinking something. Oh, I was with them. It was the three boys and Peter, and we were all out and drinking. And they were, they were drinking. And he got into an argument with Nigel Stock. And Nigel had been in the Chindits in, in Malaya during the war with, with Colonel Wingate. He was a stalwart, whatever he was, a military man, but he was very proud of his army background because he'd seen a lot of action. No tools started needling him. And Peter, frankly, you know, I think it's no surprise secret, it was very left-wing. So, you know, army, all of that, that establishment stuff, he didn't like any of it. And plus he was Irish. And I can't remember the words he used, but he used something that really got Nigel. And he started to goad Nigel about Wingate. And there was a big fight, a big threat of a fight. <laughs> what are we into? But the two stuntmen who were with him grabbed him back. But O'Toole liked to provoke. He was a provocateur, he was. He loved to provoke you, get the best out of you. Both O'Toole and Brando, what you learn at drama school, the first thing is to do animal impressions and learn to take away all the inhibitions we have to be naked as an actor and express. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think they had this innately, almost childlike quality of curiosity about life. Ruling Class is an astonishing film. I absolutely love that. He plays a, an English aristocrat who thinks he's Jesus Christ, but, I mean, really thinks it. He lives it. And he's, he's a beautiful Jesus. I mean, a Holman Hunt, sort of auburn-haired, kind of almost blonde. Um, and and a, just his family are brilliant as well. And, and there's sexual depredation. There's all kinds of weird things. He allowed me to play and be free and to do things. And I thought, oh my God, this is such a huge part. This is going to be just lovely to work with him. Darling, I'm waiting. What? Oh, it's ridiculous. It's not dignified. Dignity has nothing to do with divinity. Oh, look, I'm not here, not now. A bike? You're mad. Don't be frightened. I'm not frightened. I just didn't expect to see my husband riding a three-wheeled bike on his wedding night. It's the only way to travel. I think Peter was used to getting perks with his leading ladies, and and I was with the director, so I wasn't interested in you know mm -hmm. part. So I didn't, and we didn't, and I think he went into a big snit about it. Come to me, because he never looked at me in the eyes again. Every scene that we did was on a, an angle, so we could pretend he was looking at me, but he wasn't. Eventually, I dragged Peter to see Ruling Class the play. I think it was at the Cambridge Theatre in London to a matinee. And we went in, but Jules Buck and Peter O'Toole, Jules Buck was Peter's agent manager, producer, father, confessor, everything. Anyhow, and to a matinee, because he was already doing country dance in Ireland with Susanna York and all that. Anyhow, so he had only little time, so we see the play. And before the play finished, Peter leaned over. I just bought this fucking play for you to direct it, and it's my gift to you. And he basically gave me the film. I think he's incredibly good in the ruling class because, again, he's dangerous. He plays this wacky guy. I mean, he was really... I mean, I saw the stage version of that and it wasn't nearly as good as what Peter did. And Peter also had great supporting actors and Harry, Harry Andrews, you know, I mean, all of them were great. He was, you know, he was a... He had incredible... He had great taste. And uh, Alistair Sim as, as a bishop is one of the funniest things you will ever see in history. Um, and it's no accident that he played these roles that were very close to him, um, uh, slightly debauched over the hill, lunatics in, in some cases, and ruling classes a lunatic, that's most to the edge of normal, of, you know, normal behaviour. You wouldn't want to live with that character. You're yeah. happy to watch them for, for, for 100 minutes, yeah. but you wouldn't want to go on holiday with them. I wanted to apologise for not being at my son's christening. <laughs> the little devil stole the show. Must be sure before I make my first public appearance. He never directed a question to me, and he just, we did the scenes, you know, and he left. Important to leave the right impression. Ignoring me, he was making it very clear. That, that, that he hadn't got his toy. He wanted his plaything and he hadn't got one. R -r -r Relax, don't. Overall impression of superiority and volatile farts, whoredoms, bloody network. That performance in The Ruling Class, which I think was a very brave choice. You know, he, he it's a dangerous character, unpleasant character. The, the tone of the movie goes all over the place, but he does that fantastic soft shoe shuffle dance number in there, and then he turns into Jack the Ripper. Um, it's, you know, pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Lover, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. There was something, I don't know what about what was about Peter, but there was something where... I'll say it, but it was something. There were some times in the middle of performance, you just say "fuck it," and went, "Okay, fuck it," and then go off on something. I mean, still electric as, as an actor, but he had that sort of kind of consistent inconsistency. But he was 
unpredictable. And that's, of course, what made him great, because he was really very unpredictable. As Stanislavski always said with actors, they need plasticity, the great teacher said. O'Toole had that quality. It's like a treble jointed. He could bend his arms here and make his eyes move there and so forth. <laughs> You also see the tension between a fellow with great intelligence, great charisma, who is, if not trapped, at least he's the bearer of this weird body that doesn't seem to want to do all the things he wants it to do. So you sometimes see the rage about his bloody limbs are not in the, in the way he wants them to sort of work. But for us, of course, it's, it's fascinating. And he, he seemed to begin to realise, oh no, this is gold. All of this, all of this mixture, nobody's got this mixture. For a few, Bob, we raced across the suspension bridge into Lee Woods, then back again over the suspension bridge, and then up into Clifton. And we came across two professors, Professor Joseph and Professor Murray, legends. They would come and lecture at the school, and they were crying their eyes out. And O'Toole said, what's the matter, said O'Toole? We've just been to see Sir John Gilgood in, in The Seven Ages of Man. He's amazing. He has a phenomenal grasp of the verse. Ah, you must go and see him. And they walked off. And O'Toole said to me, it's amazing, isn't it? They're so enamoured of Sir John, they fail to realise that both you and I are bollock naked. <laughs> <laughs> I was invited to speak at Spike Milligan's memorial at St Martin in the Fields off Trafalgar Square in London. There was um, old Sykes and, and Eddie Izzard and, and Peter with his son Lorcan. Now bear in mind this is a church and it's getting more and more crowded as actual guests who are not speaking turn up for the proper hour. And he starts to tell me, he says, you know, there's such shit. He said, such shit. He said, do you know, who's that awful old fraud, that dreadful man, Tolkien? Tolkien, you know him? I wanted me to play a fucking wizard. A wizard? I don't want to play a fucking wizard. And they said, you'll love the script. I said, I won't love it because I won't fucking read it, love. He said, and one day this boy comes around on a motorbike and he's got these scripts. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm told that I have to give you the script and, and, and wait here and that when you've read them, you'll so love them that I, I, And Peter said, I'm not going to fucking read them. By the way, they're blue. Why are they on blue paper? And the, boy, the boy biker said, well, I think it's so you don't photocopy them. Photocopy them? Why would I photocopy them, pompous cant? And this, this was ringing around the church. <laughs> and then he said with a fabulous wave of the hand, he said, anyway, I think they've offered it to Ian. He'll be brilliant. And I remember my father being like, this is all fucking gobbledygook. I'm not going to spend four years in fucking New Zealand and this is all nonsense, etc." So it was, it was quite a funny moment. Oh, and Peter was born in Leeds uh, to Patrick and Constance in 1932. Well, he wasn't. I, was, he, he was, I don't believe he was Irish. I mean, I, 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 it never occurred to me that he was actually Irish. He just had an Irish name. Well, because he was so frightfully British, I mean, it was an accent he'd acquired. I, I think his accent would have been made in Rada because it wasn't the Rada voice. I mean, there's never been a Rada voice, but they definitely did teach you to speak standard English clearly and loudly. He was very proud of the name O'Toole, yeah. and he was very happy with the fact that his father had been a bookmaker and was from Ireland. I think it started when he became famous. It didn't start before. He, he didn't... Uh, I mean, everyone knew he came from Leeds. And um, it was when he made his name in The Long and the Short and the Tall and then Lawrence of Arabia happened. But, you know, the minute he became successful, obviously the press starts to make stories. And somehow, I don't know how... It became known that he was born in Ireland. My father never claimed to be born in Ireland because he wasn't. He was born in Leeds, as the records show. He was born in Leeds in an Irish ghetto to an Irish father in an emigrant city. So he was Irish through and through. Well, he certainly regarded himself as Irish, didn't he? And he was a, 
He was, he was Celtic of personality, it would seem, a lover of uh, the romance and the Celtic twilight and the poets. I have never revealed his life before he met me, although he did slowly and painfully confide in me bit by bit over the years, and I've never been able to repeat any of that because it's, it's his business. I don't think he understood it even, but I, I imagine, like you, that, that it was a traumatic childhood. I don't know if Sean feels the same, but that's what I've certainly felt coming off him, that there was this real conflict that, that, that had never been resolved between his roots and his Anglo Anglophile element. He had a bully of a father. Yes, he did. He did. His father said, jump off the mantelpiece, and he, he, he had no trust. You know, he didn't know what was going to happen to him. said, I've got to have a place in Ireland, so I was delighted. And we found a place in Renville on the cliff top, and that fell through for some reason. And we found a place somewhere else, and that fell through. And then suddenly somebody said, there's a little place going on the Sky Road. And I didn't know what the Sky Road was. So we said, we'd buy it. So we bought it, and then we went to look at it, and it was lovely. It was a little cottage with a lot of land. Um, it's, I think, about 70 acres of land and a little forest and a little beach, and it was just lovely. One of the earliest memories of mine is being with him in Clifton and Connemara in Ireland and him walking me to the sea and um, putting me into the cold water and giving myself a wild experience of nature. To actually walk out onto a stage in front of a thousand people you have to be a bit crazy. So the ten kind of wild guys, they weren't real, except O'Toole. He was a real McCoy. He was wild. He was dangerous. He could fight. He had imagination. So I did this film, and when I arrived in Ireland, Lee J. Thompson uh, directed the film, Country Dance, and when I got there, there's O'Toole in a ditch, and he'd got manacles marked bleeding on each arm. He'd been fighting the police all night and had him in cells. When O'Toole saw me there arrive on the set, ah, you big boy! Ah, and he charged at me and I had to kind of do a, a cross buttock, bring him down oh, onto his back and pin him down. And Lee J. Thompson thought, what, who in hell have I bloody em employed? He's worse than O'Toole. We had a little clash over now, now and again. Um, <laughs> this in the restaurant. In Carcassonne, we were wrapping up the film. And he came in and he wanted to start trouble. I mean, he was a, you know, the Welsh and all that. A devious Welshman. And I suddenly had a couple of those, come on, come on, come on, fight. Right. Well, now it's on the back of it. I was going to deck him. I said, give us a kiss. <laughs> and before we started filming, um, dear Boris Segal and his lady companion, uh, well, Boris, decided that they should have a read-through, just Peter O'Toole and Peter Strauss. And um, they would do it calmly, it would just go through the script and so on. Peter O'Toole arrived absolutely dead punctually on time, but uh, Boris and his lady were a little alarmed that he did not have a script with him. And Boris said, uh, Peter, we, we were going to do a read-through. And Peter said, oh, do I have to read? And uh, Boris said, well, of course, unless you know it all. And he said, well, I hope I do. And they said, you know it? He said, well, I hope so. Are you sure? He said, well, we'll see. Shall we start? And he knew all the lines. As they went on, he knew them all. And his memory was formidable. His memory was absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Once he'd learned something, yeah. it was there forever. And O'Toole said, no, you've got to know your lines. If you don't know your lines, you can't even start. And he said to me once, it's like learning to dance. If you don't know the dance steps, you can't go. He said, you can improvise, but it all falls apart. And I think what O'Toole did, he would examine underneath each line. And I learned that from him and to dig under the text, dig under it, to find new meanings in it. 
he could remember poetry that he learnt when he was five, little pantomimes that he might have been in at school when he was six. Every single line. And you cover the first line, Hail Alexander, when do we meet? And you say, Hail Alexander, when do we meet? Hail Alexander, when do we meet? Hail Alexander, when do we meet? And then you move it over the next line and so on, all through the script. And they looked at him and said, Learnt the whole script like that? Yes, he said, it's a very boring process. But, I mean, you have to know the lines, don't you? But there was, yes, a, there was a sort of desperation in, in that sense, I think. And um, I know Sean Phillips still speaks of him with enormous love and affection. And there was clearly, it was a marriage that was impossible for her on many occasions. But, she, you know, he was as charismatic as a, as a figure within a family as he was as a figure on a stage or in a, uh, on a screen. Uh, he was the love of my life and I was of his, I know. And we had a wonderful relationship. You know, it was difficult from time to time as well. Um, but it was, it was also wonderful. If I gave a thought to fascination I would know it wasn't right to care Logic doesn't seem to mind that I am fascinated by a love affair. Still, my heart would benefit from a little tenderness from time to time. But never mind, cause baby, I'm a fool who thinks it's cool to fall in love. He had been on a bender with, uh, with a journalist friend of Hours and they came back and he said, I don't feel good. And he went to bed and, and they diagnosed uh, pancreatitis. So it was the Royal Free in uh, Hampstead, down the road, that was able to take him in an NHS hospital. And they had all the equipment there. They told me to, to expect the worst. And there was nobody there. My mother and the children were on holiday. Nobody knew that he was in there, but the press gradually got hold of it and they would ring up and uh, to check the obit. And one day he opened his eyes and he was better. And it was against all the odds. And uh, we went home and he went to bed and the children came back. My mother came back from holiday and everything went on as though it had not happened almost. But I had I had nearly died myself when I mourned him for four weeks. I was heartbroken for four weeks. And um, he said, we must go on holiday. So we went. We could only find out of season one, one hotel in Italy. We had the best. We were there for a month. And then out of season, there was nobody else there. And then we were there for another few weeks because we liked it so much. It was wonderful. And he recovered, and we came back to England. And I thought, I really did think that our life had turned, taken a turn for the better somehow, that we, I, I felt I was different having lived through his death. I thought he must feel different as well, but he didn't. He nearly died, but he wasn't aware that he'd nearly died. So to him, he was just better. So he said, no, 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 we'll go on just as we did before. I'll go away and I'll come back. You come out with me and settle me in and then fetch me back. And I said, no, I have to be, I have to travel with you because he was frail still. He said, no, 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 not at all. So I realized actually that we'd reached the end of the road after this idyllically happy time, this awful time and then this wonderful time and then it couldn't go back to square one. So whenever the buzzer went, it was always a bit of a tense moment. So the buzzer went, and it was, could you please come down to the living room? We need to have a family talk. And I knew in my bones what it was. I'd tried to help my sister by preparing her for it, but she didn't want to hear it, really. She was just that bit too young, I think, at the time. And I said, but I want to leave. I want to start my life again. I don't know <laughs> about the speech having been written for my mother, but she did announce that she was leaving. And she said, do, does anybody have anything to say? And of course, Mangi was there, my, our grandmother, and she said, I have plenty to say and I am not going to say it.
it is one of the more mighty and vehement and sublime vehicles which Shakespeare wrote. I dragged him on to the stage. Silence. Shock. Couldn't believe it. Terrible. Horror. They thought they were being conned. It was sad, really, because he, he should have been, could have been, ought to have been a wonderful Macbeth. But uh, something went wrong, and I think, dare I say it, I think it was the drink. You know, there was always drink in the dressing room. And, and so when Peter came on, he thought he was going at the speed of light. But actually, he was going so slowly that Macbeth, which is a, a fairly short play, became endless. And um, that's what the, the critics picked up on. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glam. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cordor. All hail, Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter. On the front page of the Sun newspaper, the most popular tabloid, the, the least associated with Shakespeare of any of our national newspapers, on the front page the next day, the headline was Macflop. On the front page of the sun. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. And he completed the performance, which lasted for probably six hours. And I stayed on the stage after I was dead as Banquo, holding on to him, waiting for him to die. Well, he didn't die. And he completed the performance. He completed the tour. He saw the job through. I said to my dad, the coal miner, my dad, I have never seen courage like that. Whatever he did um, worked. Uh, the only time it didn't work was the Macbeth. And I think that was because he wasn't in control. He was half Scots, half Irish. So there was a <laughs> there was a unity in a conflict at the same time, <laughs> you, you know, and uh, I, I think that was what was really that was really what his skill was. But he also had the sort of very he could do the British thing very well. He could do it much better than any of the others. He could do it much better than Albert, much better than Tom or or Alan or even Richard. He could do that. Rugby may make more row, but we'll row 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 forever. Steady from stroke to bow, and nothing in life will sever the chain that is round us now. O'Toole, in this total way, somehow understands that it's about a whole period in Hollywood filmmaking that that performance is embodying, as well as a kind of down and dirty sort of comic, um, ruthlessness about what gets a laugh. He had a great comic skill as well. He was a very, his timing was pretty amazing at times. And that was one of the things that was kind of, again, compelling about him, really. Others may fill our places, dressed in the old light blue. We recollect our races. Winning an Oscar is very much about what campaign are you running in Hollywood to win this and what interviews are you doing, what chat shows. I didn't think he cared about that. I went to the Oscars twice with him. Uh, once uh, when he was nominated for Venus. Uh, I think it was 2007. And the other time in 2004 when he was nominated for his, not nominated, he was given his Lifetime Achievement Award, which he highly resented to begin with and actually turned it down to the academy and said, you know, you're, you're retiring me. I don't want any of this at all. And they said, well, it's a miscommunication. We really want you to accept this award. And after a little bit of um, debate, he, he decided to go for it. He hated all that. He called, he called the Oscars the dog and pony show. And he didn't want to go. And he certainly didn't want an honorary Oscar, which is what he got and he uh, objected to that. He wanted to win one outright. 
If you want to have an Oscar, you have to go to L.A. and you have to do a lot of publicity work, a lot. Uh, you have to campaign for it. You know, it takes months out of your life. And he was never prepared to do that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go. He never went to Hollywood. And seeing him in Jeffrey Bernard on stage this 16 times, couldn't take my eyes off him because you need to follow every move. Has he forgotten his line now? Is he just wobbling or... No, no, no. This one man holds the entire 1,100 audience at the Old Vic in a vice. But I saw Jeffrey Bernard is unwell many times. That was fantastic. Some, I mean, really fantastic. Some people say the greatest comic performance of the 20th century, and I'd be inclined to agree. It really was spectacular. I had highlights as well. I remember going to the theatre one night and Jeff was actually there, Jeffrey. He was still alive at the time and he was absolutely drunk out of his mind and he was at the bar refusing to leave and the bar staff didn't know what to do because the curtain was going up. And uh, so I was telling my dad about this and he said, oh, well, they should have just put a velvet rope around him and charged tickets. Couldn't you have telephoned? Now, if I put you in a cab, will you promise not to fall out the other door? You only get out of life what you put into it. Fancy a spot of cat racing, Jeff? You're a mean, alcoholic, diabetic prick. And? You make me sick. But you're never snide and you never hurt. And you wouldn't want to win on a doctored beast. And anyway, the least of your pleasures resides in paltry measures. So guard, great joker God, please guard this great Bernard. Let him be known for the prince of men he is, a master at taking out of himself and us the piss. <laughs> He knew this was the last, it's the, one of the greatest parts you could ever have on, in theatre. And he knew it was his. The people who'd taken over from him um, knew it was his. They, they couldn't manage it. Uh, it was Peter's. And lots of people have played it since, but nah, it was Peter's part and he knew it. And I think taking it to the old Vic was, must have been balm to the soul. And it was an unofficial farewell to theatre that he really loved. I I don't have the right to be calling him O'Toole, except he is a legend, but I saw him in Geoffrey Barnard is Unwell, the story of a Soho um, literary bohemian drunk um, of brilliance and comic kind of uh, uh, delight. People are always surprised to learn that I'm a domestic animal. <laughs> Peter did not have his script with him. He already knew it by heart. It was a huge part. He had it down. I think he had, in three weeks rehearsal, he maybe had two prompts. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he spent rehearsals doing something I've never seen anyone doing. He was working out, he had to do a lot of lighting of cigarettes, a lot of smoking of them, stubbing them out. He had to um, pour soda into his glass and find tomato ketchup and the vodka. He had to stagger about the stage, he had to look in things. And he worked everything out, even to when do I take a breath in. Comic timing, including working this, this now this sort of, almost like a mime's body a long, stringy Marcel Marceau of slightly gangly stuff that he could do. And um, he, he became the master of it. Who the hell do they think washes my glass up every morning if there's no one else to do? <laughs> I cook, I sow, I reap. And there's an egg trick, there's a trick, a magic trick in the show, which he did two runs of it that went on forever, months and months and months. I think the egg trick only went wrong once. Um, the egg trick is a strange one, I don't understand, but it involves a shoe, a biscuit tin lid, a pint mug, um, a matchbox and an egg. 
You need a good and steady hand, Keith said. <laughs> Here goes. One, two. And the idea is you tap with the heel of your shoe some bit of this when it's all been set up in a tower and the egg plops into the glass of water when you've done it right. Um, Peter did it right every single night. Now, once we're to an evening meeting at Windsor, I got absolutely arsehole, lost every penny in my pocket and no idea how to get back to London after the last race. I was practically the only person left on the racetrack. And as I stood desolately in the car park, I suddenly saw this beautiful white Rolls Royce heading for the gate. I stood in its path and signalled it to stop. The owner, suave as any film star, said... Yes, what can I do for you? I said... He said, I'm pissed and potless. Please take me to the Dorchester immediately and buy me a drink. <laughs> I'd never seen him before, and I'd never seen him since, but he was absolutely charming. He recognised someone who'd done their bollocks and was feeling thirsty. His last night, we were all in tears. And the audience were, as always, on their feet. And he turned round and he went, having taken the curtain call, he went... And Charlie came on with a tray of glasses with champagne. And Peter then proceeded to make a speech. <laughs> and spoke about each one of us and what we had contributed and how and how well he thought of us, I mean, and, and basically wished us luck. And it was, he gave us a handover like that, which was so wonderful. Last week I had an erection. <laughs> I was so amazed. <laughs> I took its photograph. <laughs> Life after death. What more do you want? <laughs> Come on, Norman. <laughs> As O'Toole himself described it at the end, he said he's, he's, he has been fortunate enough to have a standing ovation, but he called this, and I was there when it happened, a jumping ovation. He was so fantastic that people didn't just stand up. When the lights went out at the end, the whole audience, audience jumped up because they knew they'd seen something which was, I would say, sublime. Oh, I was so proud of him. I mean, he was just... Brilliant, he was marvellous, and his, his physical dexterity, you know, he was, he was a wonderful farceur, apart from it. He could do anything, and his, uh, his uh, elegance and his, uh, his comic effects, and he could, he, I, I just loved everything he did. It was wonderful. She doesn't belong here. She never did. I found it most odd. Odd? What she says about you, despite your hatred towards me. Which is? Nothing. He made a dried-eyed farewell to acting, but as far as I know, I mean, there were films coming out with Peter O'Toole even after his death. That, you know, so it didn't look like he stopped, and I, I wondered, could he ever stop? Catherine speaks the truth. I thought, well, see if I can get a script together and do this film from some documents, an ancient diary that I'd discovered um, and we'd had for years. Cut long story short, the, uh, the diary seemed to be quite important and seemed, allegedly, was written by St Catherine or Catherine of Sinai. And so I formed a script from there, and on a gamble, sent it to every actor I could, Josh Ackland, Peter O'Toole, Stephen Burkhoff, Edward Fox, and so on, Brian Blessed and Freddie Jones, the great, great actors. And it was just a, a gamble. And then all actors came back and said an immediate yes, which I didn't have the budget for. And Peter was the last to come back. Now, I just assumed that he wouldn't do it because he'd retired. And on the notion that he wouldn't do it, I then sent the script to Herbert Lom and said, please do this, this film. 
And then Peter suddenly, I think it was a phone call to the studio and it was Peter. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry, Peter. I just assumed you wouldn't be interested. And I gave the part away. And then another call came and um, it was Peter. And he said, well, write me a fucking part. <laughs> and I, that was it. So I did. Peter visits this girl in the prison cell. And I think it's a, a lovely performance. Beautiful, harmless child. I knew then damnation would follow, having lived most of my pitiful existence by extremes which would sicken the learned heart. He's um, uh, a, a Roman senator. He's embarrassed by the wealth that he's lived under. And I now take my place alongside other greedy, pitiful souls in Maxentius' great hall of shame the absolute embarrassment on his face with this young girl. He doesn't know how to approach this young girl. I wrote you a cowardly letter, should you have refused to see me. Do you wonder where the dead and buried go? Does it fear you to know nothing of all whereabouts and including all spirits, their ultimate Distinction. And uh, for me, it's it's uh, a very very moving scene. I feel more at ease in this reckoning of eventual death. I want to go to the pictures to see something I don't see in the rest of my life. Well, I ain't seeing Peter O'Toole at the end of my street, and I'm not seeing him on the telly. I'm seeing him 60 foot across at the Empire Leicester Square in parts that that unusual poetic sensibility, which you know is there. You read his autobiography and it's a, it's neo joycean stream of consciousness um, that is, and that in completely infuses what you see on screen. You know, if you feel it's a Yeatsian, Joycean, Wildean kind of uh, Irish braggadocio, which is unique. I wish I was in Carrick Fergus Only if the nights in Valley Grand I would swim over the deepest ocean the deepest ocean my love to find but the sea is wide and I can't swim Sing 